Okay, so uh, our next speaker is Ben Brown, and uh, he's going to tell us about X, Z, Z, X surface code. Ben, please. Okay, good morning, Munich and the rest of the world. Uh, my name is Ben, and I'm speaking to you from Sydney. Um, I'm looking forward to telling you about my results that I did with um, uh, Pablo, David, and the Steves. Uh, a special thanks to Pablo and David, who really did all the all the simulations and all the hard work. So all I get to do is a, all I get is a good pleasure of telling you what our results are. And thank you to the organizers for having me here for a, a short plenary talk. Um, right, so let's let's go. Um, quantum error, quantum error correction, quantum computing. So it, it's it's still hard to build a quantum computer, as I expect everybody knows. Um, but we're making progress, and um, the problem is all the qubits we make are just a bit too noisy, but we can fix that up with quantum error correction. Uh, Naomi gave a nice tutorial about that at the weekend. Um, so what does that mean? We're, we need noise of qubits, and we're never going to get the noise out of all the physical qubits we can make in the lab. They're never going to be perfect. But what we can do is we can put them together in, in, in quantum error correcting codes, uh, lots of physical qubits, where um, by adding more and more physical qubits, um, we, uh, we can make an absolutely good logical qubit as long as the noise is below some certain threshold amount. However, um, the qubits we have right now are just kind of on the cusp of getting below threshold. Um, uh, there are lots of examples. I've just shown two here. This is definitely not an exhaustive list. Um, but what we need to do is we need to find better quantum error correcting codes with higher thresholds, and we need to get uh, codes with um, the, with, with or better quality qubits uh, to get them below the threshold. Um, and then we need to control lots and lots of these qubits all together to work together to make a quantum error correcting code. And all those things are hard. And then even when we've done all those things, we have the problem of overhead to deal with, which means we, we have to make lots and lots and lots of qubits, all of the same kind, all working together, all making parity measurements over and over and over again. And they all have to be below threshold all at once. And all those things are difficult. Um, okay, so a question we like to ask ourselves at Sydney quite a lot is, uh, well, what, one, one thing we like to do is, uh, one, one branch of research here that I'm not so involved in is the characterization of qubits. So we imagine, say, um, uh, we, we work hard on uh, working out all the noise that qubits experience um, and all the correlations and all the bad things. And then we like to ask the question, well, say we know all that, what's the best code we can make that can compensate for all those problems and we'll, we'll, we'll make the right quantum error correcting code to deal with those shortcomings. Now that's a really hard problem and it, it could take a long, long time to optimize it perfectly or maybe we never will. Uh, maybe we'll never have to, but um, anyway, we, we, it turns out we've made some progress in this direction by saying, well, look, a lot of the qubits that we, we work with, uh, they just experience bias noise, like dephasing errors are much more common than the other types of errors. So let's say that, let's, let's not worry just now about characterizing every kind of error. Let's just say that the Z errors, the dephasing errors are much more common in our qubits. And we're gonna try and build the best code we can around that. Um, okay, good stuff. And now, so that, this is a really well motivated noise model because we have uh, in, in the bosonic qubit literature, we have what's called a cat qubit and they can be tuned up to suppress all the bits of errors, so the only types of errors you really have to worry about are dephasing errors. So uh, people are really building those. So two of those references you can see at the bottom there are experimental papers building bosonic cat qubits. And we can even do gates. It, you know, it's all well, well and good having the qubits, but you also need to be able to um, entangle them with the entangling gates. And that can unbias your noise, but luckily with the cat qubits, we have ways of um, keeping applying all the entangling gates we need and keeping the noise biased. So this is a well motivated thing to do. And one other paper, um, Amazon's recent proposal is to uh, use these bias qubits to build full fault tolerant quantum architecture. Anyway, so that's that's what we're talking about. Bias qubits and what's the best code we can come up with to deal with that. And this whole train of thought led us to uh, what we're calling now the XZX surface code or the XZX code or the ZX code uh, as I get lazier through the talk. So all it is, it's just like the surface code. And as I said, we saw Naomi's tutorial and ex they explained all about the surface code. It's just a two dimensional code that you can build on a chip. Um, and it has stabilizers 
uh, we measure these stabilizers over and over again to spot the measurement errors. And well, the surface code you can see on the right of the screen there has Pauli X type stabilizers and they detect the Z errors. And Pauli Z type stabilizers and they detect the X errors. Well, the, the, the ZX code, X, the ZX code is very similar to that, um, except instead of having X and Z type stabilizers separately, all the stabilizers are the same, but they all go X, Z, Z, X. That's it, that's all we did. Uh, we, we thought about this code, do them in bias noise. And to get from one to the other, all you have to do is apply a Hadamard on every other qubit. So on the right now, what you can see is uh, the green qubit, you apply a Hadamard to those, and that rotates the regular surface code that everybody knows onto the ZX code that I'm gonna be talking about. So it's not a big change at all, really. Um, but well, let's, let's just, I can say, I can give a little intuition for why this should be a good thing. Because in the regular surface code, we have roughly N on two, stabilizers that are there to deal with uh, the Pauli Z errors. The, the Pauli Z stabilizers don't spot the Z errors at all. So about N on two of the stabilizers are looking for Z errors. And each one is responsible for about four qubits. What we've done with the ZX code is we've made all of the stabilizers equally responsible for looking for Z errors. And each one is now only responsible for looking on two of the qubits. So in this sense, you should expect a little improvement or something. Well, anyway, this is what I'm going to tell you about. Um, we get really high thresholds. Um, in fact, this code matches the hashing bound everywhere. We were only interested in bias noise at first, but this code's really good at dealing with all single qubit Pauli channels. Um, the decoders we make to get these results, some of them can be generalized to the fault tolerance setting, uh, which is important for practical reasons, because that, well, what that means is we can deal with measurement errors. And finally, I'm gonna also tell you about how bias noise and bias noise specialized tailored codes can uh, have lower overhead if the noise really is biased. And we can do it all for computation. So I've got, I've got not too much time to tell you about all those things. Um, I'm gonna do it with the XZX code. Okay, so let's talk about decoding. Um, uh, so the Toric code uh, has errors and we measure the stabilizers. And the stabilizers tell us where the errors should be. Um, and yeah, that's fine. So the, the stabilizer is supposed to give the plus one outcome, but sometimes they give you the minus one outcome and that, will, that means an error has shown up somewhere. And you've got to figure out what error occurred given that configuration of defects. And well, on, on the surface code, there's a nice geometrical interpretation for what these errors look like. These errors look like strings and the defects live at the endpoints of these strings. And so the, the job of decoding is really just pairing them up. You find the defects and you pair them up to figure out what string cause the error and you look, assuming the errors are gonna be not too many, you look for short strings to pair up nearby defects. So you can actually think of this as a conservation law. Uh, it's a conservation law in the sense that defects always come in pairs. It's a defect parity conservation law because um, you can't make an odd number of defects. So this actually, this conservation law allows us to pair up the defects and it gives it all this nice structure. The, the surface code comes from the topological phases of matter and they, have quasi particle expectations that respect fusion rules. And so you should expect all these things. But you can actually see this in the stabilizer group. So here's, here's a summary of how to decode the surface code again, or the toric code. And um, yeah, and, and what the symmetry, the, 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 that conservation also has a symmetry that gives rise to this defect law. And that's important. We're going to use that. Um, so yeah, we, again, the defects of the surface code, they live at the endpoints of string like errors. This allows us to pair them all up. Uh, using whatever kind of pairing algorithm you like. We use minimum weight perfect matching all the way through this talk, but there have been some other nice proposals like union find and all, all sorts of other ones. Um, and right, so this is really present in the, the stabilizer group. So you can take the product of say some big subset of stabilizers and you can get the identity. So all the star up, all the Pauli X stabilizers, which are the star operators in the surface code, they give you identity if you multiply them all together. And since they're uh, eigenvalues have to be plus or minus one, then you can also promise that there's got to be an even number of minus one stabilizer outcomes or an even number of defects will show enough at once. So this is the symmetry in the stabilizer group that gives rise to the conservation law that allows us to decode it. And it was my idea of, uh, my idea with Dominic Williamson um, to generalize this and we realized we could do it all over and, and we, we did that and we found we could even generalize it to bias noise if we, uh, so we wrote down a more general version here. So um, what we said is let's not think of all the Pauli errors. Um, let's just think of Pauli Z errors. And um, well, now we can find other sets of symmetries. The symmetry 
group gets a lot richer. Um, so, for example, the product of all the plaquettes uh, through this diagonal of the XZZX code, this gives a Z operator. I've, I've drawn what that product is. And so that means Z errors acting with respect to these symmetries, are also, the, the subset of stabilizers are also going to respect the conservation law. Um, specifically, you're only going to get an even number of defects if only Z errors happen along this diagonal. And this gives us heaps of advantages because what that means is uh, the strings in the toric code, a reason why the threshold's a bit lower on that one is because the strings can go all over the 2D space. But in the XZX code, the Z errors just make these strings along these 1D lines. So all you have to do is you, is you just decode it like it's the one the repetition code. And this has a really, really high threshold. So we saw that and that was, that was good. Um, so, and it has a lot of other symmetries as well. So the X errors, they also make symmetries, but along the other diagonals, you can see the X errors run along um, the, the perpendicular diagonal to the ones I was just talking about. And the Y errors, they run along uh, perpendicular, uh, vertical and horizontal lines. The uh, Y errors make uh, 1D, uh, respect 1D symmetries as well. So in fact, the XZZX code has lots of really nice symmetries for decoding it for all the different noise biases, like infinitely biased X noise, infinitely biased Z or Y noise. It's already good. So we ran this through a maximum likelihood decoder and we got this figure on the right, the, this figure on the right. Um, well, this is like the convex hull of all the Pali errors where this point is infinite X errors and no other kinds of errors. And this is infinite Z errors and no other kinds of errors. In the middle is depolarizing where X and Y and Z all occur with equal rate. And we plot the threshold on the on the on the y-axis of this plot. And well, what we found was this manifold uh, that we found. Um, <laughs> not me, Pablo and David did all the numerics. This, this one was by David actually. Um, the yeah, these um, these thresholds actually match the uh, the hashing bound, which is uh, well, it, it's down here. So the rate of which you can send information, like the number of logical qubits that you can send through uh, end uses of a quantum channel, uh, you shouldn't be able to send uh, more qubits of one minus the Shannon entropy of the, the, the probability vector of your X and your Y and your Z errors. And so this code, the surface code by itself, um, it doesn't, um, uh, it, it has a vanishing rate, so we set R to zero and we find that, yeah, we, we set this equality and we find this manifold is exactly the hashing bound, pretty much. Uh, in fact, when I say pretty much, we actually beat it in a few places and that surprised a few people, surprised us. Um, we find, yeah, so we, we, we plotted, uh, we looked at a particular line on that manifold as we approached infinite bias Z noise and we compared it to the hashing bound. We found our threshold actually just started creeping up above it. Um, and we did more numerics to try and figure that out. So here, here we plotted. So the thing is, these are numerical results. Um, so we, we haven't proved that we've been the, the hashing bound. Um, but what we did is we made, if we proved it, we'd have to check it works all the way to infinity. And we can't do that with numerics. Uh, we don't have a big enough computer. But we can look at how the threshold converges as we approach infinity. And we looked at some pretty big system sizes between 60 and 77 over here. And the threshold looks good and flat as compared with it. it hasn't changed at all since the threshold we made around sizes 30 to 40. Um, so that it's quite encouraging that our numerics are showing that we're beating hashing. Uh, this shouldn't be too surprising. Um, uh, there have been other works doing this, uh, but they do it with random constructions. Uh, this is uh, this is a nice structured uh, 2D surface code, and we have all the decoders worked out. The random coding examples they don't necessarily. Um, have all the decoders worked out. Um, okay, so lots of, <laughs> you might be asking now, well, that's the hashing bound and you're supposed to send a finite rate of qubits to do that. Uh, and, and we're not, we've got a vanishing rate code and you're not the first person to ask that. Lots of other clever people did too. And um, well, um, but we can, uh, we didn't write about this in the paper, but um, we, we, it's gonna be in the next draft. And um, well, we can by concatenation. So we have this code uh, that has a threshold higher than the hashing bound. And we also have, well, it's not our result, but uh, there are finite rate codes out there as well. Um, and they might have a lower threshold, but what we can do is you can concatenate a, a code with a threshold above the hashing bound with a finite rate code. And then we only have to grow that inner code 
to a certain size uh, before its logical failure rate is below the threshold of the finite rate code. And the combination of those two things should let you beat the hashing bound. Now, again, our results are numerical. We haven't proved that, but supposing we had such a code, uh, in principle, we can be sending um, uh, finite rate information above the, the hashing bound error rate. And um, yeah, so well, and we're doing it with an LDPC code if, if this all works out as we expect. And well, so to test it a little bit further, we also managed to beat the hashing bound with a suboptimal decoder. Uh, this is, these are also new results since the first paper we've got on the archives. Um, yeah, we did it with a minimum matching decoder as well. And that, that was nice because we can, because it's a lot faster the decoder, we can simulate much larger sizes as well. Um, yeah, so lots of, theoretically that seems pretty interesting. And I'd like to be able to prove that the XZX code is doing that. And hopefully we can have a couple of ideas and hopefully we can all meet a real QIP next year. And I can tell you why all my ideas didn't work. Um, okay. So fault tolerance thresholds, we have those as well. I am getting through all my results now. Um, I've still got a bit of time left. Um, okay, so we collected some fault tolerance thresholds. Um, so if you wanna spot the noisy measurements, uh, so what in a realistic system, you measure your stabilizers and sometimes the stabilizers don't give you the right answer. We call that a measurement error and we have to deal with that problem in the lab because that's gonna happen sometimes um, for whatever reason. And so to deal with that, um, what we do is we repeat the measurements and then when we decode, we decode on, say we have a two-dimensional code as we do here. Um, you, you decode in this two plus one dimensional space, this 3D space. And so that's how you would decode the regular surface code. Again, Naomi talked all about these 3D codes as well in the tutorial, so I suggest you take a look at that. Um, but in the XZX code, uh, we have these one dimensional symmetries that give us these really high repetition code thresholds. And so when we generalize these uh, symmetry based decoders to the fault tolerance setting, uh, instead of decoding on this two plus one dimensional space, we get to decode on this one plus one dimensional space. So effectively, what happens in there is we, you might have learned in the Dennis paper, you know, the, um, you know, one of the seminal ones, um, the, when you decode the repetition code with noisy measurements, you really get the 2D surface code back again. So instead of having these 3D minimum weight perfect matching thresholds, you really have these 2D minimum weight perfect matching thresholds. Uh, so, and we know that threshold should be about 10%, uh, and we kind of get close to there. I can explain why it's not quite high enough, and I can circumvent that problem, but this is how we did it in the, this is how we did it this time. Um, and yeah, so we, we compare that to our old results. So we got these results in this, reference number 25 and we were excited about those because uh, originally if you were to decode a bias noise model with regular minimum weight perfect matching in the conventional CSS surface code way the threshold would have been about three percent so we did get quite excited last year with these numbers around five or six percent that's a massive boost for bias noise codes but we ended up right up at eight or nine percent with the XZX code at these finite biases so these biases around a hundred or a thousand which experimentalists tell me are about the numbers the amount of bias you would expect. That means for every one bit flip error, you expect maybe 1,000 or 100 uh, dephasing errors first. Um, okay, uh, so yeah, we got really high fault tolerance thresholds, which means cat qubits, bias noise qubits are gonna have a really high threshold in, in practice, as well as just, you know, in theoretical perfect measurement 2D hatching bound world. All right, so, uh, lastly, oh, no, no, sorry, I forgot that bit as well. Um, okay, so when we, I told you I was going to show you that we can reduce the thresholds, uh, the overheads as well, once we're below threshold. So when you get below threshold, the question is, how many qubits do you need to realize a code of a certain size? And, uh, well, typically, if you have a code of distance D, so D is the weight of the least weight logical, then I'm glossing over some details here, but roughly you expect the logical failure rate to be about P, the qubit error rate, where P is small below threshold, uh, raised to the power D on two. That's the probability that D on two errors all line up uh, along, along this part of the logical. That's what you expect normally. And here is, here is how the, the surface code might fail. Um, in the regular case, some Z errors line up along a line, and you just can't tell which correction you should make, and one of them will give you a logical error. So you're a bit stuck. Uh, right, but what we saw um, 
And what'd be nice is if you're dealing with bias noise, um, if you're dealing with bias noise, uh, you can actually pick one of the logicals to have a much higher weight than the distance of the code. Um, so this is studied in this PRX uh, by David and others. Um, and we can do that with the XZX code as well by putting on a, uh, on a periodic lattice on a torus uh, with certain dimensions by D by D plus one. And then the string like logical Z has to coil round and round the torus lots of times. And so you need far more than D on two errors. You need more like N on two logical errors. That's great if the bias is infinite, but it's not infinite. You have to worry about the bit flips as well sometimes. So the question we wanted to answer with this XZX code, since the decoding is so nice with all these symmetries, is, uh, yeah, how, how does this do? And um, and how does it do at finite bias? Well, we, we use this as a toy model to test that. And it's not quite as good as you would hope in general. Um, in general, when a few bit flip errors come in, they, they ruin this nice property a bit, but it's still quite good. Um, so now, now we're back on the regular surface code again, and it will fail when a long line of errors wraps through the wraps through the lattice. But in this particular version of the model, uh, half of that string has to be low rate errors. So whereas before, if you remember, I said the logical failure rate should be about p to the d on uh, p to the d on two. Well, now it's p to the d on four because about half of those d on two errors need to be high rate z errors, but the other half of them they can be low rate errors. Where, or they need to be low rate errors, where D on four of them are, uh, have error at P divided by the, the noise bias. So they're really low rate errors. So in fact, we get this improvement in general of uh, one on the noise bias, which again is like one on a hundred or one on a thousand, all raised exponentially to the, the code distance. That's a big improvement, which means if we want a logical qubit with a certain logical rate, we don't have to make the code nearly as big. Um, and we did some numeric, so this is all, yeah, Pablo did this, it's really great stuff. So we use this method of Bravi and Vago, and this lets us simulate really, really low error rates. And uh, we, we fitted the data to something quite a bit like this, this model. And these straight lines, they're actually just, they have a one parameter fit, which really just adjusts the, the intercept. All these gradients are exactly as we expected. Uh, so this, this was noise bias, if I think about, I think this one's about three. Uh, I've forgotten, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a reasonably high bias and very low P. And uh, we found our data agrees with this ANSATS and the error model and the, the types of errors we expected in the, the last slide. And we also found, um, so you do also see this N, uh, P to the N scaling sometimes, but it's kind of a small size effect. Um, not, not too small, um, but when the probability of P to the D squared is bigger than the the probability of the errors I was just talking about, the strings of low and high rate errors that run across the lattice. Well, then you do actually see logical failure rates that decay more quickly than P to the D. And that's what this graph is showing. Uh, we, we were supposed to expect these straight lines if we were really seeing P to the D type scaling, but because the logical failure rates are actually more curved, um, yeah, it's, it's decaying faster than that. If you're at very high P and quite small system sizes, uh, we see that. But in general, what you should expect is what we saw before. Now, one other thing that you should be worried about is we did all that with periodic boundary conditions. And well, we can also do it with open boundary conditions. And that's quite nice because open boundaries are easier to fit on a chip. And they're also useful for doing gates, which I might just be able to mention at the end. Um, yeah, so what you can do is if you change the lattice geometry from square geometry to rotated geometry, well, now your logical Z strings don't run through the diagonals. They run from one side to the other side. So there's no point making the, the, the height of this rectangle quite so big because you're only protecting yourself against the low rate X errors there. So we can make that distance much smaller. And yeah, that, that's a big saving in overhead. So we, we save like a factor of log of eta again in, in, in that direction. Um, so finally, uh, another important thing to worry about is gates. As I just mentioned, you need these open boundary conditions and you can do what we call code deformations with the surface code. Uh, you, you, you change the stabilizers around and you, you measure a slightly different version of the stabilizer code and all these tricks can give you uh, logic gates. So we, we wondered how that might work out as well. And I'm running out of time a bit, so I'm, I'm, I'm rushing. Um, but we checked how that would work out for some interesting kinds of code deformations. You can do it with any, um, I summarized Lot, well, I put lots of references of different kinds of code deformations, and they'll all work, but in our paper, we just picked this Daniel Latinsky one, because that's quite a nice streamlined way of doing things. 
Um, what we wanted to check, I mean, obviously it works. It's a surface code. It's locally equivalent to a surface code. But we wanted to check that all the other things you have to do when you do fault tolerant quantum computation with code deformations, that we still get to keep the high bias. So what we checked, the things we checked, and if you check these things, you've really checked everything. Uh, we checked that you could initialize a piece of surface code and still have a very high threshold to noise bias. And um, we checked that. And we also checked that uh, you could introduce what's called a twist to the surface code. I haven't got too much time to tell you what that is. Um, but we, what the important thing to check was that if you put a twist on the lattice, you still have these nice 1D symmetries. And you more or less do a twist puts a little branch there. Um, but we expect that if you add twists to your lattice, then you can, you can protect this nice high threshold that we saw when we did all the numerics with the memory. So, uh, oh yeah, we have some work coming. We're, we're doing some work on the circuit noise and uh, we're actually simulating that, uh, the, the, the X code with some cat qubits with uh, these people, Shruti at Yale, Andrew Damalan and Anna Grimsmo and well, David too, uh, who are over on this side of the world. Um, uh, yeah, I don't have time to say too much about that, I'm afraid. And this is a summary of the talk, uh, but I trust you to remember 20 minutes ago, so I'm not going to say that. But uh, we have a lot of interesting questions now, like, did we really beat the hashing bound? Here we, this is really the first try at a non-CSS code that we've studied. Um, what's the potential of other non-CSS codes? We should probably have a little look into that. And yeah, as I said, my question at the beginning was, how do we specialize codes in general to deal with certain uh, correlated noise models or like specialized noise models? I think that's a really exciting question to address. So with that, thank you for your time. Uh, sorry, I got a bit rushed there at the end. I had a lot to say. Um, and I'll see you all over in the round table. Maybe have time for a question before that. Okay, thanks, Ben. So uh, can you make a comment on the Y errors? Because you are talking about a non-CSS code. Mm. Yeah, well, no, this it, it's, it's really good at Y errors as well. In fact, we expect it to perform, if, if you have biased Y errors, we expect it to do exactly the same as we wrote about in our old paper from, let's say, old last year. Things move very fast over on the side of the world. Um, yeah, um, it, it's going to have very high thresholds, not quite as good as the the, the bit flips or the Z flips um, uh, using the decoders that we have at the moment. But there's, there's plenty of potential. In fact, I, I think it might be worthwhile exploring that some more. Yeah, but it's okay, not so something uh, to worry about. Okay, so uh, I recall that in the Wim model, uh, they actually have this issue with the latest size to be odd, 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 even or even odd. Is there any consequence of that in your situation? Yeah, if you have, um, if you put it on periodic boundaries, yeah, the, the dimensions determine how many logical qubits you get. Uh, if, if the boundaries are open, um, which is probably what we build anyway. So it's exact, all the properties of the surface code just map over. Remember, it's just a Hadamard on every other qubit. So all of the code yeah. parameters really stay about the same. The only funny thing with the WEN model is the fact that you can have one logical qubit instead of two logical qubits if you put it on the wrong torus, yeah. um, which is, all right, <laughs> you can, it's just a toy model. <laughs> okay, uh, okay, thanks for now. I guess uh, we'll ask uh, you guys to go to the round table and have more discussions here. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I, I need to learn how to get there. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you, you'll see the message uh, from uh, the technical support. All, All right. right, thank you. Uh, thanks for yeah. listening, everybody. Bye bye. Okay, sure. Bye for now.